Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon and thank you very much for joining us today. Um, my name is Alessio Pathalano, I'm a professor of war and strategy in East Asia at the Department of War Studies at King's College London um, and a member of the Centre for Grand Strategy um, at King's. And today we are delighted to host the first event of, of, of a set of three that are trying to um, engage with um, the, the, the relevance of the integrated review that, uh, that was published last year by the British government, in particular sort of uh, trying to take stock of things that have happened during this year um, and review together with some uh, leading experts uh, in the country and well, well beyond the borders of the country, um, sort of uh, try to make sense the extent to which the document that appeared last year still remains a vile sort of guidance, a lighthouse uh, to, uh, uh, for the UK to navigate the continuously sort of changing and evolving dynamics in international affairs. Um, today, um, as a starter, um, we're going to be talking about some of the basic first order principles, the sort of key, some of the key, um, if you want, grand strategic ideas uh, that have uh, created a, an overarching framework for British grand strategy um, mm -hmm. in, in the modern times and try to see how the integrated review sort of navigated within those. In particular here, I'm talking about that sort of um, long-standing British engagement in trying to sort of find a, 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 a balance between a continental and maritime informed strategies. Um, the other two events before I, I come to today's uh, 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 main conversation, the other two events, just for those of you who are uh, joining us today, will take place on the 31st of uh, May and then on the 13th of June. Uh, the second and the third events, as I said, will start sort of dig uh, more uh, in depth into specific events that might have affected how affected how we think about the integrated review. In particular, the first, um, uh, so the second event on the third, 31st of May uh, will explore the impact of Ukraine um, um, on the integrated review. And then on the 13th of June, we'll think about how the potential uh, 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 changing dynamics in continental Europe through uh, German announced increase in spending in defence might actually affect British grand strategy. And in many respects, the second and the third events really will build upon the conversation that we're going to have today. And for those of you who are interested in signing up, you will find the details about the events um, in the chat um, here on this Zoom call or indeed on our events announcement page um, at King's and the Centre for Grand Strategy. But enough about the future. Let's come back to today's main event. So first of all, let me introduce uh, the, the, the key speakers. I am absolutely delighted to have this conversation uh, with uh, uh, Dr. Basil Germont um, at the um, Lancaster University. Um, Dr. Germont um, completed his PhD, his PhD um, um, as a Graduate Institute of International Studies in Geneva and then went on uh, to work in Oxford as a visiting research fellow at the Changing Character of War programme um, and today stands as one of the UK leading experts on maritime and security issues. In particular, his work is trying to sort of expand our understanding of, of, of maritime affairs and what maritime strategy entails. And I'm particularly grateful for him to joining us today, taking time off from his business schedule uh, to share some of his thoughts. And of course, if we want to talk about uh, British grand strategy with a continental flavor, uh, no one would be more apt to, to take on that mantle than our other main speaker, uh, Professor Rob Johnson, um, at Oxford, changing character of war, and also one of the country's leading experts um, on a number of subjects. Historical, uh, to begin with, his, his work with on Lawrence really defines this idea of linking strategy operation to grand strategy um, and the understanding, in, if you want, of a certain tradition of strategy in, 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 in British history and British statecraft. But also more recently, his work um, sought to link um, the transformation of NATO 
to British interests. And perhaps good time also to, 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 to point out that soon he's going to be picking up another a very important role as the first director of the newly established uh, um, Centre for Net Assessment at the UK MOD. So taking his wealth of experience at the heart of the practice of statecraft. So thank you very much, um, uh, Robin and Basin, for today. Um, our order of battle, um, each speaker will take 10 to the 15 minutes uh, with some introductory remarks. Um, I will complete uh, the conversation with some final remarks on the back of our two main speakers, and then we will um, sort of open up the conversation um, to your questions. Now, um, as it is now standard practice on Zoom-based uh, events, uh, you can either ask your questions or submit your comments on the chat or indeed in the Q&A space. Um, unless, of course, um, uh, you uh, have any sort of uh, challenge in, in using these two tools, please just raise your hands and then we'll enable you to speak um, and ask your question. So, um, all the instructions are clear. I just want to mention for anyone uh, 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 on the call that the event is currently recorded, will be recorded. Um, so please uh, keep that um, uh, in mind as you pace your engagement with us. Um, now, without any further ado, uh, Basil, uh, the floor is yours. Well, thanks a lot. Um, thanks a lot, Alessio, and um, thanks for um for the opportunity it's really a great pleasure for me to to be here and to participate in um, in this panel i think it's it's a very exciting topic uh, a very important one for the country and especially now in the context of um, of the uh, ukraine war um let me just share my screen alessio could you please confirm you can see my screen, please. Okay, brilliant. So what I'm going to do, um, I'd like to, um, to talk about um, the, um, the integrated review uh, in relation with um, the idea of Britain as, uh, as a sea state. But to begin with, I think it, it's important to understand that uh, the, the IR is more strategic than the two previous uh, iterations of the defense review in 2010 and 2015. So I think it offers an overarching direction, obviously a very vague uh, direction, but an overarching direction for, uh, for Britain's security, defense, economic and foreign policies. And as you, as, as you know, it's all about uh, adopting this uh, global outlook. But um, it's also very important to acknowledge the fact that the IR is, um, is also very much about adopting a maritime uh, outlook. And to be clear, I think that um, it's the first time since 1968, after the decision to, to move uh, back west of Suez, it's the first time that we have such Kind of strategic document uh, which is not sea blind, which accounts for uh, so much for the importance of the sea uh, for, for, for the UK. So the IR is vague as a grand strategy, but I think that the direction is clearly uh, maritime. And we see that with the emphasis on the fact that the prosperity and security of Britain depends on the sea, depends strongly on the sea. There are a lot of references to, um, to the, um, the carrier strike group and naval forces, especially in the accompanying uh, comment paper. But my point is that it goes beyond that. Uh, the IR, I think, recognizes um, that Britain is a sea state and indirectly suggests that a sea state needs a maritime uh, grand strategy. So the first point uh, I'd like to, 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 to make is around that, what, what is a sea state uh, in, in, in theory and practice? Because if you, if you think of the, the traditional conception of, uh, of sea power, the, the Mahanian conception of sea power, basically it's this uh, mutually beneficial relationship between 
uh, a thriving maritime commerce and a powerful navy to protect it. So it's, it's all about strategic sea power. And we, we can argue naval power and command of the sea. So what is lacking there, it's the ideational dimension of, of, of sea power. And uh, Andrew Lambert uh, wrote this masterpiece uh, published in 2018, the book titled uh, sea, sea States. And um, he, he makes the, the, this point about um, the, the importance of, uh, of thinking in terms of the soul of sea power, the spirit of sea power. So that's what I would call the ideational dimension of, of sea power. So sea states, they, they develop a maritime outlook because it is in their interest for various re re reasons. Um, but um, it's also linked to the development of a maritime identity based on the adoption of, of maritime values. But uh, maritime values are not so much natural because of the relationship between human beings and the sea as a milieu. So maritime values, they have to be nurtured and they have to be promoted by, uh, by rulers. And that's how we can understand why uh, maritime values have often uh, been linked to broader maritime related or maritime friendly values, such as freedom, trade, uh, liberalism, um, more inclusive political systems. And I would say eventually uh, fluidity, uh, fluidity when it comes to alliances and the conduct of uh, foreign policy, innovation and, uh, and flexibility. So um, some, throughout history, some, some sea states have managed to combine this maritime outlook and maritime identity with naval power and they have become sea power great powers you can think of athens venice and the netherlands and perhaps the last of them england but we can claim that today there's no more sea power great powers because the us has the most powerful navy ever but uh, we can argue the us is a continental power uh, not, not not a maritime uh, one but we can also uh, argue that um, the West, uh, as a collective of uh, nations interested in the stability of the global maritime order, is the heir to sea power states. So I think that in this context, when we, when we reflect on the integrated review, I think that the integrated review suggest that uh, Britain can play its part in support of the global maritime order, but that in turn, this will uh, benefit the, uh, the UK as a sea state. Which leads me to the second point I wanted to make uh, today, um, to, to, to question whether the integrated review is uh, too uh, maritime. Sir Hugh Strawn, said it's aspirational because well in a sense the it's likely that the objectives are not going to be uh, all fulfilled because of the lit limited means at disposal and i think that later on alessio you are going to talk about the need to prioritize uh, theaters uh, of uh, of operations also uh, our two main competitors, Russia and China, they are continental powers. The Ukraine war is um, a continental war between two continental states. And, um, and clearly the West uh, has not been in a position to use uh, its overwhelmingly dominant uh, naval power. Uh, due to the specificities of the Black Sea from a geopolitical perspective, but mainly because of the need to avoid escalation with a nuclear power. But that said, my point is that the, the, the competitors, the continental competitors, they are vulnerable to, uh, to sea power, especially if we understand sea power beyond naval power we understand sea power 
in its collective um, meaning and uh, we also include civilian uh, stakeholders in the equation so based on that i would say that the uh, integrated review is not too maritime on the contrary it it says what it has to say uh, to 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 make the most of uh, the, the comparative advantage uh, of, of the uk in the context of the current uh, situation and uh, the, 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 this idea that sea power is something we have to understand as a collective and with an input by civilian stakeholders. So there are like-minded maritime nations or nations interested in the stability of the global maritime order. And we can say that in a sense, the West is a sea power collective the US Navy being the muscles, the UK perhaps being the soul, but obviously there are other sea states, small sea states such as Singapore or Denmark, and there are uh, big continental states such as France or Australia, but uh, states that are part of the West and share uh, this interest in maintaining the stability of the global maritime order to oppose, to oppose revisionism and illiberalism at sea. But it's not just nations we are talking about, also civilian stakeholders, private actors. Think of the Ukraine uh, war, uh, when states are uh, prevented from using their naval forces to help uh, Ukraine for, for the reason uh, mentioned before. The private actors uh, step forward. Um, the major all the major shipping companies but the chinese have stopped operation to and from russia and this is having uh, impact there and it's recognized uh, in, in, in russia as having impact or when we close our ports to russian flagged owned or operated vessels this again demonstrate the importance of the civilian dimension of, of, of sea power so my point is that like-minded maritime orientated nations and relevant maritime stakeholders they all share both the benefits and the cost of maintaining a stable liberal maritime world order and opposing revisionism so in my conclusion for today is that in the post-ukraine era we have to understand the integrated review as being not just about global britain but being about maritime britain but maritime understood not as naval it's not the uk trying to become the next great naval power but it's about um being fluid uh innovating flexible um, making the most of uh, what um, this maritime outlook can bring to the UK in terms of its contribution to the global maritime order, to the interest of the West as a collective and uh, as a way to oppose uh, revisionism and illiberalism at sea. And I think I will uh, stop uh, now. Um, Basil, thank you so much for, for, for the clarity and, and, and the power of the delivery. I mean, I'm, I'm, I hear you uh, loud and clear that there is a, a dimension about global Britain that is also about maritime Britain. Um, and in a way, I think the very powerful point that you made at the end, uh, this has to be understood as something that goes well beyond the traditional understanding of sea power as something that relates to, to, to the size of your guns, as it used to be the case in the mid 20th century. It's much more than that. And that system I think um, uh, that you mentioned, the one whereby you've got the civilian uh, dimension, the one that speaks to the, the sea as, as a means of transportation, as a means through which um, goods are delivered, through which prosperity is accelerated, created and sustained. That's a key element in which that the sort of Britain um, can engage with. And I particularly sort of, um, I particularly uh, uh, enjoy your point about how this is this is also um, it's not just about uh, a state approach towards a strategy it's also about a creation and a sense of identity an identity that certainly existed in the past and that was associated to a large extent with 
empire. And that perhaps the integrated review implicitly tried to reinvigorate by linking Britain as, 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 a, as a superpower in a different dimension, whether it is science, technology. And now, now the, the, the next step is to link the different dimensions uh, that are beyond the material power to what it means in the maritime sense to enhance that idea of a, of a, of a sea state culture, as it were, or a sea state self perception of self. Excellent, thank you. This is, I'm, I'm sure that we'll have lots of questions there. This was super. Rob, tell us, what do you think of all of this? I'd like to say thank you very much indeed for your warm introduction and um, to be able to participate in uh, the Centre for your Grand Strategy, which is a super organisation. More importantly, it's super, not because of what its name is, but because of actually people in it. So I'm delighted to, to take part. I'm wearing my combined uh, operations tie uh, today in honour of um, commandos, both army and uh, marine, uh, but also um, maritime characters on whom they depend. Um, and I should just point out that I'm not speaking on behalf of the UK government. Uh, I'm not actually in that job yet. I'm still an Oxford academic at the moment. So, um, so that my, my remarks are going to be on that basis. Um, just a, a, an opening vignette, really. Um, an Australian diplomat, because of the dip chat mouse rule, I can't name him because I'm going to refer to his, his comment, said uh, recently that um, the UK needs to act on the global stage because currently and recently the United Kingdom has tended to underplay uh, its global role, uh, perhaps through a lack of confidence. Um, and we hear a lot about global Britain. Um, as a sort of brand or as a statement of the integrated review. But it's worth pondering for a moment um, that uh, Global Britain is not some historicist throwback to an imperial era. Um, it is actually about issues which are global and which are going to affect the United Kingdom. And the United Kingdom, I think, through the integrated review, is trying to step up to those responsibilities, which is a, a permanent five member of the Security Council, you know, it really should be dealing with. But as you know, all of you, it is much more serious than just, you know, a document. Um, because if you take, take for example, uh, Lin uh, Zhibao uh, of China, a spokesman of the People's Daily, um, he uh, wrote uh, on the 24th of April, 2022, in an editorial, that a new global order is being marked out by Russia's um, operations in Ukraine, uh, but uh, marked out because Russia is making a closer alignment to China. And he argues that only China and Russia have the capacity and the will to replace the United States and the United Kingdom uh, as the globally dominant powers. So uh, we are in, in a very interesting situation because while our attention is very much focused on whether the integrated review lived up to the aspirations uh, in, in its aspirations in, in light of the war in Ukraine, um, we need to go back one step and go, uh, well, what is the bigger picture? And I think the bigger picture was uh, to integrate foreign policy and defense policy. Um, and I think we, we can say straight away that uh, it has been effective in the Ukraine crisis. Um, there were diplomatic efforts that coincided with the deployment of a Royal Navy and allied naval demonstration in North Atlantic, uh, and Russia took notice. Um, the land training teams in the United Kingdom were withdrawn to avoid a direct conflict with Russia. But uh, the UK switched very quickly to weapons supply, uh, diplomatic cohesion with NATO, and economic measures. So three domains already uh, even in the land environment, were being invoked. And, and that was what the Integrated Review wanted to do, to bring together these levers of national power. And I think, actually, uh, we can say broadly, uh, it did so. It also recognised that we're in an era of global contestation, uh, that the rules-based international system uh, that was set up after 1945 is under pressure, um, that economic leverage, it argued, uh, would be used across the globe. And all of those things have indeed come to pass much more quickly, I think, than perhaps even... Uh, the writers of the Integrated Review um, thought. Uh, the Integrated Review also makes a very important point about focusing on the future, not on the past. I think that's very important, particularly threats and uh, opportunities. And in terms of threats, we know uh, Russia was the immediate threat, the pacing threat, as it was described by uh, the last CDS, that China was a more systemic threat. Um, there was also this question of nuclear proliferation, which needed to be addressed, and 
crucially, of course, climate change consequence. Uh, in terms of opportunities, uh, we've heard uh, already, you know, Basil's given a great um, uh, exposition of what global Britain might have meant uh, and what it might mean. Um, and I think we were rather distracted by the deployment of the Carrier Strike Group um, and HMS Queen Elizabeth Act to, uh, you know, the, the Far East. Uh, actually, the Integrated Review makes the point that trade is the emphasis of the Indo-Pacific tilt. Trade is the leading component. The maritime bit was just the optics that I think we were, we were looking at. And the other one, of course, is the tech revolution. Uh, the Integrated Review recognised uh, the uh, enormous impact that the technological revolution, artificial intelligence, supply chains, so on, is going to make on our lives. And that is certainly true. The Integrated Review also, though, makes the point that Britain wants to engage China constructively over trade and over climate. Uh, and I think, you know, that remains to be seen whether that component uh, is going to be uh, a possible. Um, what we are seeing, though, is the United Kingdom leading uh, in a post-EU membership uh, role, leading in Europe in defence and security, uh, which is to be applauded. Now, there are a number of implications, though, that I think we should um, examine. You know, did the Integrated Review um, get its implications right? Did it foresee things correctly? Well, um, Britain was supposed to be a global player. Is it? Uh, yes, I think it is. Uh, I think that broadly, um, the assumption was the Integrated Review would make Britain more of a global player, um, and I think that's true. And that the maritime uh, arm uh, would be the leading arm of that uh, emphasis with air and space very quickly falling behind, supported by and supporting uh, a diplomatic effort. And we've had COP26, we've had uh, G7 leadership, uh, we've had the AUKUS deal, the joint, joint declaration with Germany. You know, this has been a pretty proactive 12 months for the United Kingdom on the global stage. There was, however, an assumption that there will be no major war for a long period of time, possibly 10 years. Um, now that echoes, of course, the sort of assumptions that were made in the 1920s with all the consequences we're familiar with. Um, but what it did say was that this would be a period of instabilities and that what Britain would need was an expeditionary capability. And, and Britain is building that expeditionary capability. I don't think it's ready uh, yet as, as where it should be, but. Um, uh, the, the architecture is in place and the planning is in place. So, you know, that's a good start. And, you know, because there wasn't supposed to be a major war in Europe or in the North Atlantic region, um, there was this idea that um, it would give Britain the opportunity to modernise its armed forces without actually needing to deploy them uh, as it had done in Iraq or Afghanistan or Sierra, Sierra Leone and so on. Now, that hasn't, uh, that opportunity has not risen. Uh, Britain is having to deploy things and, and build things uh, as it's flying them, as they say. Uh, so that is slightly problematic in terms of an assumption. But NATO remains a pillar of uh, regional security, said the Integrated Review, and that's also true. In fact, if anything, NATO is far stronger now uh, than it was uh, some years ago. Now, there were some other implications which are a little uncomfortable. Um, one is that the United Kingdom will remain cohesive. Uh, the union will be whole and entire. Well, that's true at the moment. Uh, but I don't think politically we can take anything for granted these days. There was going to be global burden sharing. Uh, we are seeing a closer relationship with um, Japan, uh, with Australia. Some doubts remain over the other pillar, though, of course, France, uh, and whether that relationship has been rebuilt or will be rebuilt during a Macron presidency. Um, lots of connections with outside Europe were going to be capitalised on um, in the Integrated Review, uh, with, for example, um, an ASEAN dialogue, uh, CPTPP, I must get the abbreviations correct, uh, looks as if it might uh, potentially happen one day. Uh, and as I say, um, distribution of vaccines, uh, leading on climate uh, mitigation um, issues, being a scientific superpower, all of those things uh, Britain uh, is trying to address uh, as it's set out. There is, however, a geostrategic shift and a geoeconomic shift, more importantly, underway. Um, and I think Afghanistan and the ending of Afghanistan demonstrated a hard landing for the United Kingdom uh, in that regard. Systemic competition uh, was foreseen. Uh, that is proving much more difficult to handle uh, than, than I think, uh, although it's going well right now over Russia, but much more difficult, I think, in the future over China. Um, on defence, though, specifically 
um, unless you wanted me to sort of address this issue about the relationship to the land and the sea and you know how that would how that would uh, go I mean in defense you know there is this mantra of detect disrupt deter and defend and, and that you know broadly that's what we're all the services are supposed to be doing together I think the maritime domain uh, you know, the Royal Navy is demonstrating that it's got reach, growing capacity. We can talk about the details of that if we like. I think there's a lot more work to do, frankly, uh, for the RAF in terms of its unmanned capability and capacity, but that's underway. Um, there's quite a lot of work to do in terms of um, future force commandos and the close cooperation and training with the Royal Navy. I think that still needs to be worked through. But the big problem, as one general told me this morning, who I won't name, um, he said, but the army's a mess. Um, you know, we, we are in trouble. Um, in terms of fires and protection, um, the army is underpowered in terms of lethality. In mobility, it's got all sorts of problems to sort out. And the, the MOD has been quite open about admitting the problems that the Ajax program has presented, that Box is not on stream yet, that Challenger 3 won't happen and we're going to Challenger 2 upgrades and so on. In land air defence, there's much more work to do, I think, to bring about a proper integrated air defence system. Um, with, pretty good in EW, I have to say. Uh, AI staff work is underway. Fantastic work going on in terms of artificial intelligence and in staff for headquarters. And, you know, some aspirations to do multi-role work. So there's a lot of talk about what rangers will do in support of special forces. I do think, though, there's a big question mark over the future of what they call uh, SFABs, these special purpose sort of brigades of troops that go out defence engagement. I think lots of questions to ask about what they're really going to be doing. I don't know if the army quite know yet what that's going to look like. Now all of this of course requires from the land forces closer cooperation with the Royal Navy and to some extent with airlift, although airlift is improving with Globemaster and everything else. Um, the army lacks its drone uh, capability. Um, I think there's, there are limitations, of course, for the Navy to, to adopt drones as, as they'd like to. But I think, I certainly think um, there's a lot more um, that needs to be done there in terms of cooperation, joint training, uh, that those things go, go together. We can have a conversation, I do hope, in, in the Q&A about, you know, Ukraine, what it means for the integrated review in, in more detail. I know you've got another session on that. So let me just broadly conclude with this sort of uh, in my, my sort of hopefully my key takeaway points. The integrated review is the best we've had for a long time. The command paper that goes with it is a very, very good implementation of that. But there are still gaps. Um, I don't agree entirely uh, with some academic colleagues that the aspirations are too great for the capability. I think there is We've already demonstrated that even simple anti-tank weapon systems can have a very bad disproportionate effect in the battle space. But we do have some gaps, surface-to-surface -surface missile capabilities, um, air defense against uh, armor, anti-armor weapons, logistics, do we have enough uh, in the land and indeed the sea environment? Are our strike drones powerful enough? Um, what about our strategic air capability? Um, what about UK civil defense, an almost non-existent facility at the moment, one which we need to learn quickly from our Scandinavian brothers and sisters how to, how to operate. But the important factors of the willingness to act jointly, the fighting spirit of the UK Armed Forces, the service culture which emphasises the law of armed conflict and good ethical standards, the leadership, particularly at junior levels, um, our robustness are very, very strong indeed. And I think as long as we give um, those who serve, the lethality, the ability to resupply, um, and the, the, the proper intelligence, defense, reconnaissance capabilities, they are an unbeatable world-class uh, armed force. So my conclusion is the balance is right, but the scale and the types are not yet there. Um, and I think they're under construction and a lot more work needs to be done to make them really fit uh, for the 21st century. Thanks, Leslie. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Robert, for adding so much into, to, 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 into the conversation. And I think a lot of what you were saying, particularly even when, uh, uh, when you referred to the uh, underpowered nature of, of, of what's been sort of thought about for the army, I think it goes back to a point that you made earlier in, in your talk about the building of the expeditionary dimension, as in, as in rethinking how the integrated review 
um, should somehow bring back to life in a context whereby today we use jointness as, as, as a polite way to, to relate to each other and we don't use land, uh, sea or air power because otherwise people will be isolated and that inclusive sort of spirit, it would be absolutely wrong. The truth of the matter is that this is about bringing the expeditionary nature of the land component to maximum sort of uh, capacity to serve the broader ideas in the uh, in the in the integrated review and and what i hear very strong coming across from you this isn't about pitching the land against the sea it's about playing to the strengths of british asymmetry access to the ocean and deliver effect on the ground so this is about coordinating the different pieces and in a way i think the biggest sort of intellectual uh, 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 negative heritage if you want is really overcoming this idea that if you talk about naval capacity or naval capabilities it's not something that is designed to be pitched against the army or the air force this is about taking advantage of the virtues of each particular environment which at the strategic operational and tactical levels provide different type of advantages opportunities and disadvantages so the sea becomes again that sort of old idea that the army becomes uh, the bullet delivered by by the navy in that sense i think we need somehow to find the 21st century version of that for all of the points that you made to really sort of uh, come to the fore and be seen in a true sense of joinness not as that polite way to avoid uncomfortable conversation but rather as the best way to maximize all of that now um, um it has come to me um to, to provide some final sort of thoughts. And, 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 and there is not much to add, given the fact that both our first contributors um, have um, covered so much ground. Um, <clears throat> what I'll try to do uh, is to, to perhaps sort of um, highlight three points that I think um, are, are bubbling underneath the, sur underneath, underneath the, 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 the surface of, of the integrated review as a process and as an outcome as a way perhaps to bring together the, the, the two views uh, that, that, that have been presented so far. The first point in this regard is how the integrated review was published in the context of what was um, a very particular uh, political debate in the UK, um, which translated into what I think is a false dichotomy. And the dichotomy that, that, that for as false as it is, has direct relevance to our conversation today, in which the land and the maritime seem to be almost uh, pitched ones against the other. And that, it be, and that is because the, the integrated review, perhaps real novelty in terms of, of, of geographical extent of a global reach for Britain, as much as a reintegration of uh, Britain's broader international and, and international sort of uh, profile, really has to do with the Indo-Pacific tilt. And how, as a result of that, the Indo-Pacific tilt has been seen by many through the lenses of the Brexit debate. And as a result of that, sort of like created this false dichotomy between the Indo-Pacific on the one hand and the Euro-Atlantic on the other. This is an absolute false dichotomy. The integrated review goes to pains to try to avoid that from happening. But the truth of the matter is that the politics of the day meant that this dichotomy has been created particularly in punditry, uh, media coverage, uh, the references in particular to the Indo-Pacific as a post-Brexit lunacy on the one hand because it either speaks to a long-gone imperial vanity and you just need to pick up your average FT reference to the Indo-Pacific to constantly find this idea of the Indo-Pacific as part of a global Britain strategy as, as a way to bring banks a long gone imperial um, euphoria. That's certainly one element of the Brexit lenses that have affected this false dichotomy. And the other one, really the idea that Britain is no longer in the capacity to have any sort of influence or role in international affairs, particularly in a place as far as the Indo-Pacific, which in the common collective imagery today in the UK is still presented quite regularly as the Far East. 
um, and whether that is for tradition or not, um, in a way, kind of like a, a, a place to the strength of this. And within the second uh, uh, um, uh, sort of reference, certainly the idea that the Indo-Pacific is pitched as an alternative to Europe, as an alternative to the Euro-Atlantic. Again, the integrated review goes to great pains to actually be very clear that the Euro-Atlantic remains the core commitment of the UK in defence and security, um, even though the EU is, 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 is barely mentioned within there. But NATO, as Rob was saying, is absolutely central to the conversation. So the Indo-Pacific really comes on top of that. But uh, nevertheless, I think a part of the question uh, a year on that somehow we are starting to move um, uh, away from, but still very much, at least at the personal level, in most of my own um, engagement when it comes to the integrated review, um, is very frequent the reference to, is this idea of, of the, the, the false dichotomy, uh, Euro-Atlantic versus Indo-Pacific, as the um, uh, uh, sort of one of the core references of the debate over the integrated review. And as I said, I don't think that is the case, and CSG21 provided perhaps the best manifestation of that. CSG, the current strike uh, uh, group deployment in 2021, was first and foremost centered on the Euro-Atlantic, half of it was in the Euro-Atlantic, it was relevant to NATO, it conducted exercises within NATO, HMS Defender conducted a challenge of, on excessive maritime claims in the, back, in the, in the Black Sea, um, something that in retrospect seems very relevant to um, uh, uh, the, the sort of uh, events that, that, that occurred la later um, uh, in relation to Ukraine. So before going to the Indo-Pacific, and really the Indo-Pacific deployment had um, a, a secondary, if you want, um, a complementary and integrative function to that. So CSG21, if it is to be taken as a reference to that conversation, to that attempt to clarify the relation between the different theatres within the integrated review, it really should be about that, um, and and perhaps we should finally take that as a, as a, as a as a as a point of departure to refresh and move forward the conversation, which for the first six to eight months would really stuck in this this sort of false dichotomy, Euro Atlantic versus Indo Pacific, with the Indo Pacific being portrayed as either an act of vanity, a post imperial uh, sort of long gone glory, or indeed an ambitious and, and vain attempt to uh, reinvigorate China, uh, um, uh, Britain's uh, global profile. Now, the second point, which I think is very important, so, so, so that's in, in so far as, as the broader sort of bigger picture. How does the marathon fit into uh, the bigger context? And in the integrated review. The second point is about how within the integrated review, the maritime needs to be reconceptualized. This is not just about the sea as a launching pad, as a platform to uh, bring uh, Britain's asymmetry in international politics uh, to the front. It relates very much to a point that Basil was making at the beginning of his remarks about how the maritime today, the idea of a sea state or a sea power state, whichever way you want to conceptualize, um, starts or stems from a different and broader understanding of the role of maritime affairs and the maritime order to international politics. And here, I think there's, there's two elements to this story that is important to highlight. Um, one is this idea of how the maritime is not just a, it is more than just sort of physical and material power. It's not about the size of the navy. It is about also how we conceptualize the role of the sea and the ocean as a habitat, as a natural habitat, in relation to the challenges that we're facing in the contemporary world, um, stemming from climate change to sustaining biodiversity. And in this respect, the integrated review um, certainly is trying to present that kind of like broader, complex picture. And indeed, to an extent, it's almost underselling what, the, uh, what Britain is doing. Here, I think about the UN Convention on Biodiversity that led to the 30 by 30 initiative, which is um, uh, uh, allowing 30% of the world ocean to become a maritime protected areas by 2030. This is a UN sponsored um, um, uh, uh, initiative that is led by the UK, is getting a tremendous amount of, 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 of traction and really has a lot to do 
with that broader understanding of the link, what it means to be a sea power in the 21st century. And, and as I say, in some respect, that this very important initiative barely ever makes the news. You don't really hear about it too much. Um, and, and, and I'm pretty sure that um, um, it, within that context, it's very much about <laughs> a missed opportunity to sell more. And it really has a lot to do with that broader integrated idea that Rob mentioned, that, that Basil mentioned, that is, that is uh, propelled inside the integrated review and that somehow has not been sort of capitalized fully. And certainly in the maritime context is seeing um, Britain leading in some of its core aspects. The second element of this broader understanding of, of the meaning of the maritime um, is about how the maritime order speaks to the stability of the rule-based international system. And here I'm using my vocabulary quite carefully in the sense that the rule-based international system is composed by different type of orders, if you want, different uh, uh, spaces in which governance is man manifests itself in slightly different formats. And in this respect, the maritime order is particularly central to one aspect that informs the integrated review all through, and that is prosperity. Today, international prosperity cannot be understood without the international maritime order, and indeed the maritime order, order underwrites it. Whether it is shipping, which controls the physical connectivity that propels prosperity, or indeed it is digital through the underwater sea cables, the stability of the maritime order matters to international, to the, to the rule-based international system. We cannot get away from it. Indeed, we need to work with it. And one of the things that I have found that the integrated review is almost ahead of its time, and in many respects, ahead of the broader understanding, even within different departments of government in the UK, is this idea that this is not meant to dismiss the importance of new domains like cyber, like space. On the contrary, it all sort of by placing the maritime order at the center of the system, the integrated review is making a statement about the type of governance that one wishes to see, one that rewards the prosperity and a prosperity that builds open societies and open economies. And that way, that's the way we should approach also our understanding of governance in, in cyber as well as governance in space. So what the UK does in the maritime context and to sustain the stability of the maritime order absolutely matters in a, in a broader uh, sense, which is why the UK has a very clear position in places where the maritime order is contested. The UK is the only country outside the US to have conducted a clear challenge within 12 nautical miles in the South China Sea around the inappropriate use and application of maritime straight base lines over the Paraso Islands. A fact that is long sort of, uh, 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 is very often, only too often forgotten and barely ever mentioned um, when it comes to the, the, the point number one that I was making, the debate over the sort of British vanity of influence in the world. As a matter of fact, Britain has made a, that statement and to the present day remains perhaps the only country outside the US to have made that kind of strong statement about the importance of order. And it raises, of course, um, a number of other issues um, and, and questions about how far the UK uh, should and can uh, sort of continuously provide support to the stability of the maritime order and what kind of statements uh, one needs to carry on forward. And here perhaps it links naturally with the point that both Basil and, and Rob were making about how do we define integrated? This isn't about, you know, if, if point one and point two that I made in this second aspect, this idea of a broader understanding of what it means to be maritime today, if we all agree on that, then the question is not just about the Navy, it's all about the various different uh, levers of national power coming to together to reinforce that statement. And here's my third point, capabilities. The integrated review, and I agree with, with, with Rob, um, and perhaps, I, um, perhaps I have to leave to my reputation of being uh, uh, study noty and, and, and <laughs> in, 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 in the way I look at these things, but perhaps I would say that, that, that the, the command paper for all its virtues, is perhaps the one element that in light of the events of last year needs a little bit of a conversation in terms of, of whether we are looking at the capabilities that are needed 
moving forward and looking ahead. Um, I think there is a clear sense that, that, that um, the direction of travel is broadly right. Um, but again, given the nature of the challenges in light of Ukraine and in light of what will happen in the Russia-China potential convergence in light of this, again, there is a question there in terms of the implementation. And it's not a fault of the command paper, it's just that some of the elements that have emerged have perhaps increased um, the, 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 the need for a conversation about the extent to which the capabilities element of this. And here, in terms of capabilities, I want to focus on two aspects. One, uh, the integrated review makes a lot out of partnerships. It really places the UK not so much as making a standalone statements, but very much making statements as part of groupings. Bilateral, minilateral, multilateral, you name it. And I think both the, the diplomatic um, and, and economic sort of um, uh, actions taken in, in, in light of Ukraine speak to that whether it is Jeff, whether it is the trilateral with Poland and Estonia, whether it is within NATO, whether it is in, com in, 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 in coordination with other European partners and allies, that is clearly there. And I think in the Indo-Pacific, that is also certainly true. The question, however, is that one needs to have a capacity to keep up with diplomatic engagement across different fronts. And certainly in the Indo-Pacific, there has been a lot of initial movement over AUKUS, Again, there is still a lot of enthusiasm and commitment, but is there enough capacity to continue to have a persistent form of engagement that rewards the broader uh, integrated agenda? Um, so number one, if partners are at the center, and certainly that seems to be the right way to approach, and I couldn't agree more with the points that, that Rob was making in this respect. The question is, do we have enough capacity? And here capabilities therefore is also humans, you know, human capabilities as the people that make things happen on a daily basis. And this leads to the second point in this regard, um, broader regional expertise. The UK still has a desperate need to increase its capacity uh, for people with a degree of, of expertise that allow that integrated element to emerge because of a clear sort of in-depth knowledge of different parts of the world. And again, if I think about the Indo-Pacific, um, rewards goes to the fact that the UK is a relatively small cohort of regional expertise that is producing incredible amount of success. But again, will it be sufficient to create a persistent, sustained form of engagement? That I think is a big question. A number of, 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 of um, initial initiatives from AUKUS to the digital initiative with, um, uh, with, the, uh, with Singapore, you know, further afield, there are questions there whether the, the HMG is, is equipped with the, with, with the relevant and, and adequate amount of, of expertise and, and talent in terms of capacity and sheer numbers, as it were. Um, so in that sense, and here I go towards the conclusion of my uh, remarks, um, the key sort of, um, if you want, um, as a question uh, to address is how to achieve that persistent nature of an integrated UK that builds upon and takes advantage of that sort of maritime asymmetry, that advantage of being maritime centric to speak to all these different questions. Um, and really, at the end of the day, um, do we need what kind of uh, how do we manifest that form of integration does hmg need um some sort of uh, forward operating uh, structures that allow to create the link between uh, um, embassies and different elements of different departments of government operating on the ground whether it is the army in Brunei or, or the navy with the two new opvs there um, do we need to have like do we need a, a, a an integrated hmg hub that covers the Indo-Pacific, it sits at the intersection between those operating on the ground and, and the policy that action that needs to be taken in, 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 in the UK and in London. And in that sense, do we need other sort of manifestation or do we simply need more people? Or do we think to, do we, do we need to reconsider elements of, of documents such as the command paper that have a 
more resources in order to be pursued? I think that's the kind of questions that we need to, to sort of engage with in light of the last few months. Because at heart, it's not the indicative review. The indicative review was absolutely sharp bang on in terms of framework, in terms of revamping and re-understanding um, what maritime means to Britain as a way to prepare and unleash and unlock its potential. But at the same time, perhaps, therefore, it's more about empowering the different levers of national power to achieve this objective in a persistent and integrated fashion that should be at the heart of our conversation. On this note, I stop here. Thank you very much for, for your time. Um, okay, now I'm wearing my uh, uh, sort of uh, moderator hats again. Sorry, there's lots of me today. Um, we have an enormous amount of questions already. Um, and perhaps I'll start with the first um, couple, um, which I think are, 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 are very much for, for Basil and, and, and Rob at the same time. So the first one really is about um, a point that, that Basil made at the beginning on uh, if the UK's maritime uh, global strategy rests on being flexible, does this run the risk of the UK being a jack of all trades and a master of none? And um, Rob, there's a, there's, a, there's a couple of questions also that I think perhaps that you would be best placed to address or engage with. Um, would the UK add other countries to its nuclear umbrella besides, uh, besides it has with France according to mutual stated vital interests? And what are your thoughts about countries that do not have nuclear weapons, but not part of a nuclear umbrella, includes the Russia, China, and Iran? So I'll start with this too. Um, basically, um, I'll start with you and then and go to Rob. Thanks, Alessio. And that's, that's a very interesting question. Uh, I, 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 I understand the point. I would say that uh, in the maritime domain, uh, flexibility, uh, is, a, is really everything. It, it, it's an asset because the sea is not a zero-sum space, uh, I, 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 if you wish. Right. And, um, uh, and that's a point that I, I keep making because when we talk about sea power, especially um, the naval element of, of sea power, we, we, we still tend to think too much in terms of balance of naval power mm -hmm. and thus in terms of a zero-sum game. But uh, at sea, especially when it comes to the UK, which is part uh, and even leading uh, the, the, some sort of a solidaristic society of maritime nations, the sea is not a zero-sum uh, space. So, um, so flexibility, such as, for example, the AUKUS um, partnership, uh, um, play, play, plays actually in, in, in favor, not, not just of the UK, but of making the most of, uh, of what we can do collectively. And that's why my point was about also including uh, civilian uh, stakeholders uh, into, uh, in, in, into the picture. Now, is it, um, is, is it, do, 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 does it mean that this maritime outlook prevents the UK from having more of a clear direction? I would say no, because uh, of the points uh, Alessio uh, just uh, made. The fact that it's not just about um, the um, making the most of the, uh, in an asymmetrical way, of the advantage of the UK, but it's about uh, contributing to the stability of the global maritime order in a collective and inclusive way, which is to our um, benefits eventually and the benefits of all. Thank you. Rob? Thanks very much, Lucio. Um, there's lots of reflections I'd like to offer on, on some of your remarks too, and also um, uh, bless yours, but I'll, let me ask the question more directly. So the first question is about, um, is the UK at risk uh, by being so flexible, trying to be so flexible, that it's a jack of all trades and a master of none? Um, I don't think so. I mean, one of the wonderful things uh, about um, the Royal Navy is that it's often, when it comes to some sort of humanitarian or climate-related disaster, um, or some you know, natural disaster, it's often the first on the scene. It's the only uh, service with um, the immediate capacity um, and I don't just mean in terms of personnel, but I mean in terms of what's available to support. Um, it's therefore the most flexible really by necessity rather than by choice. Um, so that's one thing to say. But in terms of, you know, what 
the armed forces in the UK are good at. I mean, you mentioned the word expeditionary, as I did. And I, I think one of the um, fabulous things about having an expeditionary capability as opposed to a territorial defence capability, for example, um, is that you do have the ability to flex to whatever sorts of crises are emerging. If it's a big refugee flow that needs support in the littoral, if it's um, some sort of question of you know piracy off the coast of East Africa, you know the um, the UK armed forces have, have, have got a lot of experience in being able to turn the hand to it. And actually, the professional military education in the UK, I think, is particularly well placed as long as it keeps on doing what it's doing at the moment to actually support that that degree of flexibility and encourage that you know um, be ready for all sorts of problems we haven't even defined yet. Um, on the non-nuclear powers, uh, you know, what is the value? How does the UK feel about it? How would it extend its umbrella? Let me just say that, you know, the important non-nuclear powers are as important to the United Kingdom in terms of alliances and partnerships as nuclear powers. There's no doubt about that. And it's partly because, you know, nuclear, nuclear weapons are not used, uh, you know, and, and let's hope they never are. But I mean, we have to be ready for that, that eventuality. Most of the crises and conflicts the United Kingdom is going to encounter um, means that it's going to be working alongside non-nuclear partners. Um, that's just a fact. So most of the NATO countries it works with in Europe are non-nuclear. Um, and, and that means that it doesn't uh, privilege, you know, a, a particular nuclear power over another. It is true that Russia and China both have nuclear weapons. But here we are. You know, Russia is now, you know... It, 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 day 70, whatever it is, of um, its war uh, against Ukraine. Let's be absolutely clear what it is. Um, it is running low on long range fires. It has been tempted to use thermobaric weapon systems. It's experimented, we think, with hypersonics. Um, and yet it's not crossing the nuclear threshold because Russian, uh, the Russian general staff know precisely what the consequences of that will be. Um, and I think there are plans I know in the United Kingdom, I'm not part of them, I've not seen them, but I know they exist, about what would happen if Russia used a tactical nuclear weapon. There is a plan. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I, at the moment, uh, we know that, that rational minds have prevailed. Um, Rob, thank you so much. If I could stay with you, there's, um, there's a couple of questions that are relatively sort of um, short and... Um, um, I want to get your, your thoughts on it. Um, based on all that we've discussed, do you believe the UK has completely moved away from a continental strategy, or do you think uh, this has been outsourced to alliances such as NATO? This is, this is great. Um, and actually, funny enough, I'm writing a book at the moment, and the, the continental commitment you know, comes up again and again and again. And I had to um, reread Andrew Lambert's book again because I'd read it the first time and I wanted to be absolutely certain I haven't misunderstood uh, what, what the arguments were about that. You know, I, I have enormous respect for, you know, the, the memory of, of Sir Michael Howard. You know, you know, I knew him and I have enormous respect for those who were educated by Sir Michael. But uh, unfortunately, I found myself uh, over years disagreeing with him that um, he came from a cold, you know, World War II and a Cold War generation where the continental commitment was the thing. Uh, without that, you know, his argument was that France would have fallen and, you know, in the Cold War, you know, West Germany wouldn't have survived and so on. Um, I'm afraid we're in a different world. Uh, and that world we're in now does not require a large scale British land force to be committed to um, Eastern Poland. Uh, the Polish armed forces are perfectly capable of a territorial defence. What the European continental powers really want us to help with are the high-end enablers of cyber, electronic warfare, um, headquarters, liaison, um, all, the, all those elements and logistics. Remember, you know, the British way of war, um, Britain was the paymaster uh, of its European continental allies uh, and didn't always play a very large uh, continental role. I know everyone's going to cite Marlborough at me uh, and the wars of the Spanish succession. Fine, go right ahead. But the point is that that wasn't uh, typical and wasn't normal uh, if you take a 400 year um, period. I think the conversation we need to have with NATO from the United Kingdom is a sort of grown up conversation about that Britain provides a very expensive continuous at sea nuclear deterrent as an umbrella for Europe. It provides enablers, air assault forces, uh, high end commandos, and most importantly of all, a maritime surface and subsurface capability and space defense and space awareness. That is a big contribution. So if people say, oh, well, it should also be in land forces. My, my view of that is Poland, I say, and Romania are brilliant. They're perfectly capable 
are providing that. They don't need uh, a British um, core uh, in there. What they want is the capabilities that Britain provides. And I think that's the sort of conversation I think we should be having. Uh, Rob, I couldn't agree more. I think there's there's two factors here that 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 in, in many respects, if I understood your initial reaction to 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 the integrated review publication, um, one is the idea that the integrated review uh, sort of like uh, broke with tradition in two ways. One, this is the first piece of document that does not start with a given strategic environment as in, oh, we inherited 20 years of war in Afghanistan and Iraq. So that's a given, and everything else is a reaction to it, right? So that's the first sort of breaking with the past. And the second is this idea that there is no other version to British defence without a British army on the Rhine kind of approach. Now, whether it is in France, whether it is in Germany, uh, you know, and you, you stretch it, you're stretching that back to, to, to sort of World War One. But I think the two great sort of uh, moments of breaking with the past, uh, one, the last 20 years of, of raising the operational context that one inherited to the strategic on the one hand, and the other one um, is this idea that there is no British defence and security without a British military army land presence um, in continental Europe. And I think that's where there is a lot of, uh, as you say, there is a lot of intellectual um, sort of also engagement to do because a, a lot of, 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 of those who've been defining the, the conversation in the country had some of these um, assumptions built into the way they were taught, the way they approached defense and security. So today we are really sort of like rediscovering and finding our, our feet again um, in, in a slightly different context. And so I think that this, the point you just made is absolutely crucial. That is the kind of like central feature of the conversation. This is not about alienating particular elements of the British military establishment. This is about re-establishing the, the tone of the conversation at a different sort of space. Now, I have a couple of questions through you. Uh, Alessio, can I just make a question? Yes, please, um, yes, by all means. Regarding you... this kind of, uh, of, of continental versus uh, maritime opposition when we think about the UK and now uh, Europe or, or, or our European partners. I think that uh, beyond the, the, the discussion about what we can bring to, to, to continental partners in terms of um, whether it's uh, land forces or, or, or naval forces, I think something uh, which fits with this argument about a naval uh, a maritime outlook and, and fluidity, as I, 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 I call it, it's uh, w w w w the prime minister was the first to go to Ukraine, uh, uh, s s um, the support to Finland and uh, and Sweden. Uh, that's the type of thing that uh, I think our European partners they, they benefit from this kind of more uh, fluid outlook that the integrated review has put forward. That, that, that's absolutely spot on. In fact, if I could stay with you and ask you something else, uh, do you think um, the you mentioned even in your remarks? Um, in fact, I, I'll ask this to the both of you because you both sort of mentioned this idea that that that, that the, the integrated here means not just the military, but it's linking foreign policy and defence, but also other aspects. And basically, you specifically talked about the civilian dimension. How do you, so there's, a, there's a, quite a couple of questions here. How to bring all government departments and non-government actors into this? And I think there is, there is absolute credit to that type of question, because in my own experience, I think if there's one limitation, that's really how do you achieve integration in a way that it's a sustainable, natural sort of um, a, a, a manifestation of the country as a whole? Basil. That's a very tricky question, uh, Alessio, <laughs> because I think the, 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 because your question is not whether we have to do it or it's how to do it. And uh, the, this, well, if you, if you just look at the, the everything maritime, um, we, we, we've got this, uh, this document, Maritime 2050, and uh, the, the, this document um, is, um, is really brilliant in that it, um, it, it not only brings together all the different dimensions of uh, Britain's foreign economic and security policy related to the sea together, but it also makes the point uh, repeatedly 
uh, that we need to adopt a whole of the government uh, approach to, to, to what's maritime. And this document's been uh, released in 2018, so, so much before the, the, the integrated review. So, so I think we, we, we've got, again, we've got the, the direction and um, as uh, Rob can, can, can help me there, but I think each time we, we discuss with uh, relevant stakeholders, uh, public policy stakeholders, they agree that this whole of the government approach is particularly adapted to everything which is maritime, uh, but what can we do to, to improve the process? It's, it, it's beyond my field of expertise. Um, uh, Basil, thank you for this. Rob, can I also ask you to add something, because some of the questions within this context is, if we go from the big picture, you know, how do we link the different bits and bobs together? But then we drill down a little bit more inside Ministry of Defence and in particular the armed services. You talked about this. Um, how feasible and what kind of appetite do you think exists uh, within the different services to achieve a level of jointness that rewards that expeditionary dimension, which in a way speaks to a, a place that is, that is a natural home for the Navy, but perhaps might create some sense of discomfort uh, to the army um, in particular. How do you think, you know, how far off we are from, from that serendipitous state, as it were? Well, so that's a, a great question. Um, and it's a great question that you started with. Um, look, I, I can't speak um, directly for each of the service chiefs, not, and I wouldn't dare even to try, but I, I can offer a sort of an observation as a sort of an outsider, in a sense, looking in, uh, as I think we all do. Um, that I, I think the armed forces, those that I've spoken to, um, uh, to use that American expression, which is rather ugly, but get it. I mean, they know that Britain has a tradition of expeditionary uh, capability. Um, and I think all three services know that that is important. Some of the greatest successes and achievements have been through uh, an expeditionary uh, mentality and understand the jointness and so on. And I think there's a lot of work to do uh, in terms of training. Um, Clausewitz reminded us that in war, all things are difficult, um, even the simplest. I have to say that's also true of the civil service and bureaucracy. Um, and I think, you know, um, what we, the critics, I find, of the integrated review um, tend to look at things from what I might call an operational point of view, right? That, you know, what about this capability? Well, we can't do this. Mm. They tend to be either tactical or operational. Um, and I think what's really important about the integrated review, and this comes back to Basil's point and the points that you were raising earlier, Alessio, is that Britain is rediscovering how to be a strategic actor, not just an operational one. And, and I think what we need, I mean, and I, I you know, reread re recently, I looked at some translations of the Chinese looking at their 2016 military reforms, asking themselves questions of the 2016 reforms. In 2021, they did a look at those and they said, how far have we got? What have we done? And one of the things that they were really pleased themselves about is that they've unified their command and control from the party to the strategic to the operational. Now, I think we have to ask ourselves a really searching question in the UK. Have we done that? Do we have a streamlined, unified command and control spine that goes down from the strategic through, you know, from the policy to strategic down to the operational like PGHQ actually executing that? Um, I'm not sure we do. I'm not sure we have done that yet. Uh, have we trained enough? You know, are we loading um, a British brigade on board of ships uh, down in Plymouth, shipping them up to Scotland for an exercise, conducting the exercise in a sort of multi-domain environment, and then shipping them home again, and then having a really good party at the end going, what do we learn from it all? Uh, with the likes of DCDC and, you know, MOD doing a kind of proper clipboard exercise of what we've actually learned from it. Are we doing that yet? I don't think so. Um, and I, that's what I would really emphasize we should get our, we should get onto, but we have to have the command and control architecture right first before we get to, to the next bit. And, and, and what a wonderful note upon which to sort of draw this, um, um, our proceedings to, to a conclusion today, because I think the, the natural sort of, um, um, ending point, um, to, to what you just said, Rob, um, don't disappear, Rob, don't disappear, stay with me, stay with me, don't switch your camera off. <laughs> Rob, yeah, I cannot see you anymore. You still there? Oh gosh! I'm, I'm oh, back. I was just opening a door. Sorry, for my guess. Sorry, no, yeah. oh, for a second sorry. there, I thought I lost you. Um, uh, no, I mean the 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 point you make now is is absolutely um, 
essential. But there's also something very important to say about this, that alongside getting the, the spine of that command and control function right, we also need sort of to continue to foster, um, because of all the things that we see, a sort of a, a tendency or, or, or a, a comfort with the mission command orientation at the lower tactical level. We need to empower people and us as end, user, in end units to be able to, on, a, on, a, on that persistent engagement that happens on a daily basis, be comfortable in their chain of command, empowering them to provide solutions and opportunities. And so the point you were making about, you know, drawing these big exercises, start thinking big, and then sort of come back and reflect upon it so that we know how to empower people or in light of the comfort of that, 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 that are a more invigorated command structure that is both vertical and then it has to be also horizontal and link it at the other parts of the goal. This is really very much where we start finding a solution. So at the end of the day, this is about reconciling the land and the sea because as Cobbett used to say, things that happen at sea only matter because of what uh, it says on land to the people that are living on it. So hopefully we managed to do this today. I'm certainly very grateful to our speakers for the wonderful, tremendous contribution. We are just two minutes late, which by my standards is absolutely impressive. Um, so thank you very much everyone for joining us today. Thank you Basil, thank you Rob, thank you everybody listening in and hopefully we'll see you again very soon with the next iteration of our seminar series. Thank you and goodbye. Thank you so very much. Thank you.